Yeah, well, let me pick up on an anonymity because I think that's very important and that's, that's really harped on by a lot of proponents of the cryptos in general is saying, well, it's anonymous, right? It allows me to transact that way. But there's a lot of benefits to that as we talk about social benefits, right? That there can be discrimination in lending, right? Uh, you can see this in the housing market and things like that where you actually, everybody is treated equally because you're just a string of characters, right? So there is some benefit there. But the, there's a regulation risk, right? That comes from the governments when we talk about anonymity because now you always hear about, well, it's the drug lords, the gun, dr the gun runners and the kidnappers that are gonna use these technologies. So let's talk about the risk to this from a regulatory standpoint. So Jim, I'll start with you. Um, what are the risks from the regulation standpoint? And is it just because it's disruptive to their business model or, or how they've operated? Or does it really extend beyond, um, beyond that? Let me back up and I'll invoke Frederick Hayek and Mary Rothbard, two big libertarian thinkers that 50 years ago were writing about the idea of unnationalizing currency and having money as private property instead of money being something that was issued by a sovereign, a sovereign government as well, too. That's what we're trying to accomplish here, I think, in the crypto universe, the crypto universe. And then DeFi is the financial intermediaries that would service all these different versions of private money. And when you get into this creation of private money, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the coins that uh, you know, we, we, we know and love as well, too, there is a certain level of anonymity. So my account is what's called a private uh, public key. You know, it's 64 digits and numbers and you don't know it's me, but if you had my account number or my private key, excuse me, my public key number, if you had my public key number, you could put it into a website and you could see all the transactions in my account back to day one. And so you don't know it's me unless I specifically told you it was me, but you could see what's happening in those accounts. There are what's called privacy coins that try and mask that. And then governments get very worried that it's at the you know, benefit of ransom and it's at the benefit of kidnappers and drug dealers and everything. But if it's also going to be a business application, I don't want my competitors to know what I'm paying my suppliers. My suppliers don't want to know that. If I got paid my paycheck, came, if you imagine a world where you're getting paid in cryptos, you don't want anybody to be able to take my public key and see how much I got paid. So you want to have some kind of protection. So there's a balance there that regulators have to do. And I've argued regulators have to sit down and they have to ask themselves a very difficult question. What is it you're trying to do? Are you trying to say, we don't want private currencies? We don't want that competition. So we're out to kill this thing altogether and make it go away? Or are you saying we need to help foster this new technology in a way that can help make it mature and make it real? So maybe what we need to do is have the SEC define what a token is as opposed to a security. They won't do it now. They like to be very purposely, purposely vague so they can go ahead and accuse some people of issuing unregulated securities and accuse others of not doing that whenever they want. We need them to define what is, to get a little off here, it, what is a decentralized autonomous organization. And what I mean by that is a lot of these crypto um, uh, protocols, they're not owned as a corporation as we know it. They're owned as what's called a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. And everybody that owns the token gets a voting right there's no board of directors, there's no president. People can put up improvement proposals and then you can vote to change the protocol itself. So what's interesting about this universe is there's no off switch because it's decentralized and there's no boss. You can go, the government or regulator can go dictate and say, you must do this or you must do that. But the problem with a DAO is it's not a legally recognized entity, except a few months ago in the state of Wyoming, they did pass a law to recognize a DAO as a legal entity. So maybe they need to define that legally so that a corporation can have a contract with a DAO. How about certain laws that when hackers hack this stuff and steal money, that the FBI has got a law to go after them as well too, because largely now they, they don't. 
If that's what you do, you're recognizing the, the, uh, that this is something real and you're helping to uh, foster its creation as a legitimate new form of finance. But unfortunately, too many of the regulators seem like they want to just shut the whole thing down. Now, there's two things to keep in mind about it. One, as I said, with a Dow and with decentralized peer-to-peer -peer trading, you can't really shut it down. There is no off switch. There is um, no boss that you can go say, you must do this or you must do that uh, as, as well too. So it will continue to exist out there. You can regulate what's called the on-ramps and off-ramps. You could tell Coinbase or Kraken, these are the centralized um, trading um, houses where you would start by trading your dollars for crypto. You could put regulations on the on-ramps and off-ramps, but keep in mind the rest of the world is using this stuff. The adoption rate of cryptocurrencies in the US is at the low end of what we've seen, the percentages of people that own cryptos around the rest of the world. I believe it's Nigeria that actually has the highest percentage of their population that owns cryptos, nearly a third of the population. So I'd like to say, look, this new financial system is gonna happen in one of two ways, with us or without us. And if we wanna say, shut it all down, regulate it so no one can use it, well, we'll let the Nigerians then create the new financial system is what we'll do. But if we want to recognize this is going to happen and we wanna have a seat at the table and help to create this new financial system, then maybe we ought to think about defining what like a token is and stuff in terms of regulation, as opposed to screaming, shut it all down. It's a bunch of drug dealers that use this stuff. Bill? Uh I think, Jim, you brought up uh, some fantastic points. A uh, couple of nuances that I'd like to throw in there. I think we need to separate. I, I like the discussion of public versus uh, private money. Uh, but I also maybe take one step back and separate out currency versus credit and uh, you know, securities, uh, securitization, uh, you know, securities market. And I think the, you know, having regulators identify you know, what's a lending protocol, what's a credit protocol, and what's a securities protocol is highly important. On the public versus private money side, uh, there are a couple of issues that come up in my mind. And the first one you addressed, it's, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, if you're going to have private money, there needs to be legal recourse for it. And you need to have institutional strength around it. So, uh, you know, if we, you know, are in a situation where anybody can create a currency and it's accepted as legal tender in any economy, all of a sudden we run the risk of instantaneously exploding the monetary base. Now, there, there's... Uh, inflation implications, there's financial stability implications involved with that. Obviously, it makes central banks nervous because their monetary policy, uh, you know, uh, transmission mechanisms will all be blown up by that. But uh, they do have an argument by saying, look, this is actually, you know, it, it has the potential to be destabilizing to an economy. So I think on the on the currency side, we need to think, you know, pretty uh, closely about, uh, you know, private money versus public money and money is is money really a public good uh do we really need to trust that this is the legal tender and we all you know accept that as the medium of exchange because if we all of a sudden end up in a situation where the you know legal tender is you know has exploded and it can be anything well you know then it it, it kind of almost then turns back to the barter system of uh, you know what i i don't want that private money i'd prefer this private money so I, I think that uh, the regulation, I, I could see where, you know, uh, there's a lot of concern on, uh, you know, authorities around uh, the aspect of, uh, you know, thinking about a cryptocurrency as a legal tender and as a currency uh, being problematic. On the other side, uh, you know, we can say, I, again, I come back to this institutional strength argument. And the idea of like a super sovereign currency makes a lot of sense to me where institutional strength is low. And, you know, if you start looking at the frontier emerging markets, which, uh, you know, we're always looking at and seeing if, you know, we can start to invest in them here. One of the first things we look at is like, OK, do we trust that the government's going to do the right thing? Is there a rule of law? Are there, you know, is there kind of a functioning economy? And if that's not the case, well, all of a sudden a protocol whereby uh, you know you have rules in place that maybe limit the amount outstanding you know uh, penalize bad behavior uh, that makes a lot more sense and uh, you know just kind of uh, doing my quick survey I'm not 
uh, you know, I, I haven't seen uh, all the coins as I think they're over 10,000 now, but Cardano looks interesting as it focused on Africa. And one of the things that we've seen in a lot of these sub-Saharan African countries is runaway hyperinflation, uh, you know, lack of uh, credibility or, you know, uh, people's comfort that the government's going to do the right thing. And I think this is where you can start to get adoption, uh, you know, of a fairly uh, stable protocol pretty quickly. And then, you know, uh, in like those frontier emerging markets, maybe that's where we get the idea, uh, you know, of a super sovereign protocol. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly that would look like, but, uh, you know, before we talk about displacing the dollar or the euro or anything else, I would be looking at it uh, potentially in, uh, you know, frontier emerging markets, uh, you know, it, uh, frontier emerging markets first. Uh, but again, getting back to, uh, you know, the regulatory aspect, uh, I really believe that, you know, once you do set the rules of the road, allow legal recourse for things like fraud, uh, getting the rug pulled where people just dump currencies on you, uh, you know, all of that will actually bring more money and more investment into the space and will help, you know, the, the real players, guys who really want to grow this and gals who really want to grow this space, uh, you know, they should welcome that type of regulation and be, you know, actively seeking out, you know, setting the rules of the road and making sure that there is that legal recourse available. Can I jump jump in real quick when you talk about yeah. with what's going on with third world countries? There's a there's a living example of that in the last couple of weeks in El Salvador. What happened a couple yeah. of weeks ago was El Salvador um, said that they would now accept Bitcoin as its as one of its national currencies. It's a dollar based economy right now. It uses the U.S. dollar as its currency as well too. Um, the reason that they gave for why they want to use Bitcoin is. About 70% of the El Salvadorian population doesn't have a bank account. Many of them, let's, let's call it what it is, many of them work in the United States with menial jobs and they send their money back to their family. Remittances, if they went through a traditional bank to send US dollars down to El Salvador, it could take a couple of weeks. It could cost 10 to 15% of the amount of money you're sending. Those people work one month a year to pay the bank. That is inherently unfair. And that is a system that needs to be changed. And that's what the El Salvadorian government said. Look, these people have no bank accounts. They could use Bitcoin. Oh, but Bitcoin's volatile. They give away 15% of their money just to send it as it is right now. And they could transfer it down to their country. El Salvador last week turned to the World Bank and said, hey, we're trying to adopt Bitcoin is one of our currencies, and we would like you to help us bring this into place with our, with our country. And the World Bank turned home and said, it's all used by drug dealers. It's dirty because it uh, uses more electricity than, a, 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 than small countries. No, you're on your own to do this themselves. They're not interested in helping them. I thought that was a terrible decision by the World Bank. They could have gone in there. They could have used their expertise. They could have used help to guide El Salvador and the World Bank could have had some real world experience for the next example that wants to come down the line as well too. So yeah, I understand why El Salvador wants to use it. No one in their country has banks. There's all these remittances that are coming. It's all getting lost in the banking system that's inherently difficult for poor people to use. This is a potential fix for that. When they asked for help, they were told no on help as well too. So it's unfortunate that the World Bank has that attitude. But like I said, the world is going to either do this with us or without us. El Salvador is not going to stop because the World Bank said no. But maybe in the long run, it's, it's the World Bank that made the wrong decision, not El Salvador in picking Bitcoin as another potential currency. Oh, hey, hey, Jim, just on El Salvador, I, you know, I agree, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, with the dollarized economy and a large portion of an unbanked population that, you know, you need to have a better solution, uh, you know, for remittances. I completely agree. And this is where I think your stablecoin argument actually would be a much better solution than having, uh, you know, something that is as volatile as Bitcoin, where I get back to, you know, uh, the, you know, my, my, my kind of, uh, uh, you know, warning is that, uh, you know, thinking we, we have to like start to look at the properties in the DeFi market and say, OK, what do we think, uh, you know, is appropriate for each activity? 
And I don't know, on the remittance side, uh, I, I think the stable coin argument is, uh, you know, so much more uh, strong and solid, uh, you know, than having, you know, working, you know, 12 months a year for, you know, what is, uh, you know, a very low wage to send a big portion of that back to potentially have that value lost, uh, you know, is, you know, in the time that it takes for, you know, your uh, everybody to kind of, uh, you know, convert the currency, get in, get convert Bitcoin back to a currency, and then uh, you know be able to use it uh, in the economy. I think that uh, th again, this is where the you know the stablecoin argument makes sense. But then, like I think this is where, uh, in my opinion, central bank digital currencies on the retail side, especially the dollar and the euro, to a certain extent, would make sense. And I think on the central bank digital currency side, like there's a there's an important uh, choice that each central bank needs to make, and it's do you want to follow China's model and say we're going to implement a centralized blockchain that we control, we see everything, and then people will say, look, you know, uh, I may have concerns about you know the adoption of you know using that digital currency, or do they make it more like a true stable coin? That you know can provide you know some level of anonymity can be settled on the Ethereum uh, you know blockchain can be settled on whatever else, but you know again it still maintains the properties of the dollar or the euro, uh, you know which are much more stable, and I think that you know again the volatility aspect is important when we look at cross border payments the majority of them are done through SWIFT now and about 85% of SWIFT payments on one side of the transaction is the dollar. And I think that's, you know, just because the dollar has been, you know, one of the, well, it's the reserve currency of the world, and it's been very stable. Now, granted, you know, the dollar, you know, several years ago fell, and everyone was talking about, you know, they're, you know, having euros and the euro replacing it. So, yes, we'll have those fluctuations between, you know, maybe these, uh, you know, stable central bank uh, digital currencies. But if central banks decide that, we're not going to go the route that China did. Instead, we're going to create our own stable coin that's backed by the full faith and credit of our, you know, of, of each government. In your opinion, would that make it then the preferred stable coin for people who are just looking to do normal transactions? Uh, you know, I get the argument that you know maybe a, Rus a bunch of Russian nationals may say I prefer you know a USDC or a, you know a, a tether because I want to just escape the whole regulatory framework. But for everybody else who you know is just saying, hey, I'm, I'm really not at risk here. Uh, I don't have to deal with the collateral problem, but. Uh, you know, uh, a central bank digital currency in the form of a stable coin actually is kind of the preferred uh, asset for me because, you know, that has no counterparty risk. So two things. First of all, I 100% agree with you that a, a stable coin would have been a better solution for El Salvador of what they're trying to do. And this would have been exactly the right thing for the World Bank to step up and say, you guys are about eight tenths of the way there by saying you want to accept a Bitcoin. Let us come in and let us help you also think about using a stable coin because it's got, you know, a much better store. It's, it's less volatile. It's not going to lose 20 percent of its value in an afternoon like we saw literally earlier this week with with Bitcoin as well. And so therefore, it would be a better choice. Instead, they elected to just say, no, you're on your own. Good luck as well. So but I also think what El Salvador is doing is if they were to adopt Bitcoin and get their population thinking about using that, it's not that big a leap then to take the next leap to a stable coin as well too. So 100% with you that that would have been a better all around solution for them, but at least Bitcoin has got them on the right road thinking about where they should be headed as well too. And it's so unfortunate that the powers that be just decided to just not help them um, whatsoever. On a central bank digital currency, I agree with you. This is going to be really interesting because the Federal Reserve came out in the spring and said, we're studying central bank digital currencies or CBDCs, and we don't have to be first. We just have to be right. We might take a couple of years to kind of understand what's going on. And then last month, Jay Powell came out in a YouTube video and said, we're going to put out a position paper on central bank digital currencies this summer, supposedly next month is when it's going to come out in July uh, is, is when it's going to come out. And all of a sudden you could see now they feel like they've got to start really hurrying 
to get a CBDC out the door. They don't have a couple of years to sit around and think about it anymore. The biggest question I have about a CBDC is, what problem are you trying to solve with it? Because if the problem is remittances and payment rails, the CBDC could be very effective at that. How would it work? You would have a digital Fed dollar. You, me, everybody else from Exxon all the way down to my 15-year-old daughter could have an electronic wallet with our digital dollars at the Federal Reserve. And we could then exchange our electronic wallet. You know, I could send her money. You, we, we could pay for uh, something at Starbucks. Double line could pay their employees with, with, with this. The, cent, the traditional commercial banks freaked out. That's going to take away all of our deposit taking. Why would anybody use us as a deposit taking function if you're going to do that? The crypto universe was initially excited. If you're going to create a digital dollar, an actual Federal Reserve digital dollar, we could bring that into our universe and use that as our stable coin. And we could really see DeFi take off by using that. Then the Fed kind of made some noise. Oh, hold on a minute here. Maybe we're going to put capital controls on this. You can only have up to a certain amount in your account. You can only do certain things with it because they're afraid that they're going to compete with the central banks. They're going to get into the banking business and they're the regulators of banks. So I agree that a central bank digital currency could be a big, big game changer. But what I'm afraid of is at the end of the day, the Fed is going to say, here's the central bank digital currency and here's the 383 rules that we're going to put on it so that we don't put JP Morgan and Citibank and Wells Fargo and B of A out of business because everybody's deposits all run over here and you keep them in an electronic wallet with the Fed and then you, you pay for everything by transferring electronic wallets and Visa and MasterCard is screaming, hey, no one's using our credit cards anymore because they could just shuttle money back and forth um, instantly for no fee and they're paying for everything that way. So the Fed puts a bunch of rules in there to try and keep Visa and MasterCard in business and keep the uh, commercial banks in business. And at the end of the day, the central bank digital currency was a good idea that's just strangled before it actually gets going. So in theory, it's, it's a, it could be a big, big deal, but let's see how they actually implement it because the central banks have a different um, a problem set that they have to deal with. They're the regulators of the traditional system and a properly run central bank digital currency competes with that system that they're the regulators of. And they could potentially be the biggest disruptor of, of traditional finance as much as the decentralized world if they were to just go, here it is, wide open, no rules, it's just another version of the dollar. So uh, I, I agree with your concern, uh, you know, given a centralized blockchain and thinking about, you know, the CBDC, uh, you know, in the form that China kind of put it in. but. If we think about it from, uh, you know, again, uh, there, there's another there's there's another potential avenue that you know central banks may choose is, uh, you know, basically providing uh, a retail stablecoin for the wholesale, you know, uh, digital reserves or the di you know the current uh, CBDC is a wholesale CBDC which are reserves. So then you provide the retail version of it and allow banks, you know, to just put it into their deposit base, allow anonymity, and it can then flood out into the system them that way. Uh, one, and you don't need to have, uh, you know, individuals uh, accounts back at the Fed. And one thing that I would like, uh, one, one aspect that I think is potentially very attractive uh, in that type of a setup is uh, if you, the idea of implementing the CBDC as kind of like the, you know, the new rails on a centralized platform uh, gives a lot of power to central banks and fiscal authorities. And one of the things that we talked about, you know, uh, or that we have, you know, kind of been talking about in uh, economics right now is the idea of monitored monetary theory, the idea that we can just start crediting accounts, giving people money to spend, you know, that they can just spend, uh, you know, what they need to. We can target individuals and, uh, you know, put money directly into their accounts, you know, and then control inflation through taxing on the back end. This CBDC could be that platform, but would central banks actually want to implement that plumbing? Because that would then take away their independence. 
So now if the central bank were, you know, effectively, uh, you know, the custodian of that plumbing, but, you know, being able to push out, uh, you know, fiscal policy is the authority, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, uh, Congress and the government, that the independence, that wall between uh, central banks, you know, and the government and the fiscal authorities is gone. So, uh, you know, I could see a, a scenario where central banks would say, you know, hey, we prefer to get this, uh, you know, something that's more in the form of an anonymous stable coin out there. And then with all the problems that you, you know, uh, it, we're talking about, we're going to address everything else more on the regulatory side. We're going to define what is a lending protocol, what is credit, what is a security, and those will be handled through the regulatory arm. Uh, you know, again, I'm not advocating for overregulation because you, you know, you don't want to strangle, uh, you know, uh, such a vibrant industry. Um, but I, I guess I like my thinking around it is, uh, you know, in that in, in in the scenario that I just laid out, uh, you know, then we get back to, uh, you know, uh, we get back to a situation where the CBDC could become, you know, the preferred stable coin, and it's instantaneously settled uh, across the Ethereum network. So, you know, now the, you know, person in El Salvador, uh, you know, the family member working uh, in the U.S. can send, uh, you know, the digital dollar over instantaneously, uh, you know, and that, that kind of solves that remittance problem. Uh, you know, and that was kind of this, um, in, in kind of, uh, you know, thinking about the, you know, institution, institutionalization of blockchain, uh, you know, that instantaneous plumbing, uh, that's where I was kind of, uh, you know, starting to think that this could all potentially displace the, you know, the dollar being the reserve currency. That, uh, you know, everything, uh, you know, from commodities to the majority of trade finance is transacted in dollars. But when central banks, uh, you know, have the ability to have their currencies settled instantaneous on, uh, you know, these blockchain networks, uh, you know, wouldn't you start to see then instead of, uh, you know, large pools of dollar reserves by countries, uh, wouldn't those reserves then more accurately maybe reflect their balance of payments and the trading partners that they actually have? Uh, because those are like the true economic flows. So this idea that you need one uh, behemoth currency to be the reserve currency uh, you know, is threatened then by the implementation of this new system. And that's, that, that was kind of the thought that I was having when I was thinking about, uh, you know, central banks uh, implementing CBDCs uh, and, you know, looking at the blockchain network and all of the latency problems that it solves and how that would then potentially, uh, you know, remove the dollar from its throne as the reserve currency. You know, you bring up a couple of uh, uh, really good points. And the first one, everybody should understand is the easiest part about a central bank digital currency is the technology to create it. That's not hard for a central bank to do. The hard part is the policy around what it problem they're trying to solve and what limitations, if any, they want to stick on that central bank digital currency. The issue again that they're going to face is, is if they do allow their central bank digital currency out on the Ethereum network, that it can be staked in some of the lending protocols, can be borrowed, can be transferred, use those payment rails. And even if the Euro were to do it, all the, all the, all the central banks were to do it, and you got to a point where there was currency trading uh, protocols on the DeFi network where I could buy oil from the Middle East and I could pay for it in Euros, I could pay for it in British pounds, and they'll accept those digital euros or digital British pounds, and they can instantly change it, not only in the dollars, but maybe even in the Saudi dinars if they want to in less than a second, without any friction, without any um, uh, restriction, FX restrictions, foreign exchange restrictions or capital controls or anything. Yes, it could really revolutionize balance of payments, efficiencies in the way that the uh, economies work. And all of the global banks would be screaming bloody murder that you're putting them out of business because what purpose do they then serve in that environment? And so this is the hard part that they're going to have to start to figure out. And I think the bank's got a problem. You're my, I mean, they've got an, they've got a point. You're my regulator. You're just not another better idea. You're my regulator. And now you're competing with me and you're, you're putting out a product 
that might be better than me. And you're going to put rules on me that I can't compete with you. I can't put out a JP Morgan coin to compete with a Fed coin and say that the JP Morgan coin is better than the Fed coin. Um, you know, so they won't allow that. Or I'm presuming that they wouldn't allow that uh, as well, too. So like I said, the easy part is the technology of a CBDC. The hard part is going to be the policy choices that they decide and the limitations uh, where they are and why they are as far as what they're going to do with it. It's going to be very, very difficult for them to, I think, figure out where to go with this. So it'll be fascinating to watch as this evolves because it's like I said, it's coming and they can't just, you know, just yell stop in the doorway and say, no, we're not going to do any of this stuff. They recognize that they have to do it. And we'll see how they wind up implementing it. No, I think it, that's great insight too. And um, that's why it's nice to have the two of you. I just have to sit here and listen, you know, too, because that was half the questions on my list, or at least we'll, we'll pretend that they were my questions I was going to ask. But let me, let me wrap this up one way too. Um, and as you're thinking about this as, as investors, and a lot of people listen to these podcasts and these, these uh, YouTube channels to, to try to get some advice. You know, Jim, you talked about sizing it. If, if all went to zero tomorrow, it wouldn't infect your lifestyle. You'd still be sitting at your mahogany desk. Um, how, how does someone do the research? Because, Bill, you're talking about doing your diligence, caveat emptor is what you said. How does one think about trying to invest in the space? And again, not the get rich quick scheme, but invest in the technology, invest in these concepts. So um, let me start with you, Bill. How does one think about making that investment plan? Well, this is, uh, you know, a, a real do-it-yourself market. I think, uh, you know, there are position papers that are put out. There's, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, y y well, it, it, it's not formal white papers, but there are a lot of papers that are being written. There's a lot of content, uh, you know, on YouTube, but you have to seek it out. And, uh, you know, unfortunately right now, because this, uh, you know, is really in its infancy, uh, I think, you know, the advantage goes to, you know, the coders who can then, uh, you know, also talk to people, you know, who have a little bit of financial savvy and you can, you know, kind of combine those two skill sets because uh, realistically what you need to do is understand what exactly that code is doing because people are, you know, grabbing code, uh, updating it a little bit, and then you can, th the, I think from the technology standpoint, you think you're doing one thing and you think you've maybe invented, uh, you know, the goose that laid the golden egg and somebody from the finance community comes by and says, oh, that's leverage. Oh, great. Yeah, no, I know what that is. And, you know, you, but you're, you're, you're not realizing, uh, you know, uh, like there, there's a disconnect, uh, you know, between the two. So uh, as we start to, you know, as these, uh, you know, protocols, uh, you know, continue to develop, I think uh, you're going to see a lot more institutionalized, uh, you know, research come out. And I think that that, you know, is when you can start to get, uh, like for somebody who's willing to put in the time, uh, you know, get your hands, uh, you know, dirty a little bit uh, more because uh, ultimately I think what you're trying to assess is, do I believe in the business model, uh, you know, of what this protocol, the problem it's trying to solve? And, uh, you know, do I believe in how it's being rolled out? Like, is it going to fit into the ecosystem and, you know, either be disruptive or take off the way I think it will? Uh, but again, this is a venture capital investment. So, uh, you know, like Jim said, size it correctly. You know, angel investing means you can lose it all. So, Jim? Yeah, if I was to say to somebody, um, this space is finance, but it's very different finance. And one of the things I've told professional investors is, this is not gonna be something where I'll, I'll let it develop a couple of more years, and then I'll take a two day seminar and I'll be up to speed on it. Any more than a 19 year old who's a freshman in college could take a two day finance or two day seminar on what is finance and say, okay, now I'm qualified, I'll send my resume to Goldman Sachs. You know, it takes a full four year degree you know, and then maybe even an MBA to even get entry level jobs. It's uh, some of the big banks because it's involved and there's a lot to it. This is involved in a lot to it too. So first thing I'd say is get started. Maybe like I said earlier with a couple hundred dollars, go to a regulated exchange, a Kraken, a Gemini, a Coinbase. Those are the big, big ones in the United States. Just buy some, buy some coin there. You know, you're in this space that will motivate you a couple hundred dollars. So it's 
it's just an education fee. It's not even an investment at this point. Now that'll motivate you to start learning about what you bought. And then you start, you start following it. You'll start acquiring a little bit more knowledge. Then maybe you want to start thinking about it in terms of a business decision. Because what I've always said to people is you don't want to think that what you're doing by buying some coin and watching it go up and down on the price chart, it's, it's like going to Santa Anita and betting on the fourth race and the horse number three, and you're just standing there yelling, go, 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 I want to win. You're missing the point. This is learn about the protocols and learn about the business models and maybe start to venture slowly into the world of DeFi, get an electronic wallet, move your money off of the exchange into an electronic wallet, look into the idea of trying to lend your coin, even if it's a couple hundred dollars, just for the fact that you've done it. As you start and the ideas click and, oh, I understand now at least what they're trying to do in this space, you learn a little bit more and learn a little bit more and learn a little bit more. And hopefully if this space does does achieve its potential and it starts becoming something that the real world is using, you get it. You understand what's going on here. And there's people that are over there still trying to figure out how to open a Coinbase account to buy $100 worth of ETH to get started. And you'll know, man, it's going to take them months to figure this out. You can't figure this out in two days. So work at it a little bit at a time and build yourself up to it and work at it with money that is at, you know, at risk money so that if you do something wrong and, or if you wind up getting rug pulled and that happens in this space, it's not, you know, it is a wild west kind of space. If you accidentally, you know, it's transfer money incorrectly, beware it's gone. If you, if, uh, and I've done that, not a whole lot, but I've done that. I've transferred money incorrectly and poof, it disappears. There's no customer service to call. You've just, you made a mistake. You got to learn how to do this stuff right. And there's, there's, there's tips and stuff like that, that people can give you along the way. So, you know, I think a lot of people that have the motivation to start this and do this, find it fascinating and don't find it work or a chore at all. They, they genuinely enjoy learning about this space. And maybe you can become that as well, too, as you will learn about the world of, of decentralized finance, this alternate finance system, and what all these coins are about and what they're trying to do. No, I mean, that's what I consider, uh, you know, hosting a round table. It's not a work. It's not a chore. It's always insightful. So I want to thank both of you, both of my guests today, Bill Campbell, portfolio manager here at Double Line, and of course, Jim Bianco, president of Bianco Research. Thanks again for your time, gentlemen. Um, it was fascinating. We'll put some links up to some of the articles and things you guys have written uh, on the YouTube channel so our, uh, our viewers can learn a lot more. And I think that's great advice, Jim. So thanks again for your time. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, tune in for the next roundtable coming soon.